Flenko, a name that's been synonymous with the MacDonald family for more years than any of us can remember. Glencoe hung outside my parents' house in Monksfield and Salt Hill for about 35 years and this particular sign here, the one that I have now stolen, actually hung outside my late mother's house for a further 15 years. The Glen of Glencoe, of course, was where the MacDonald family were massacred on the 13th of February in 1692 as a result of a traitorous, treacherous plot by the Campbell clan. A total of 38 members of them were massacred. A further 40 women and children lost their lives after being burnt out of their homes. But thankfully a few MacDonalds survived, otherwise I would not be speaking to you today. Or chances are those of you MacDonalds who are watching this today might not be on this earth either. But thinking about the Glen of Glencoe and all that went on in the 17th century got me to really wondering about the MacDonald grandparents I never knew and indeed about their parents going back into history. So I decided to set out and to trace my own roots in as much as was possible. But little did I realise that my starting place was going to be one of the most terrible events of Irish history of the last 200 years. The Great Famine of the middle of the 19th century destroyed the Irish people. It destroyed them in body and in soul, as is evidenced from these haunting images. When the potato crop began to fail in 1845, the population was 8 million. By 1852 we had lost 2 million people. 1 million fled the country in a desperate attempt just to survive, while a further million of our people succumbed to starvation and disease. This is what is represented in a number of memorials, including this one at Eden Quay in Dublin. Unlike the hundreds of thousands who fled to the US in coffin ships, as captured in the famine memorial at the foot of Croke Patrick in County Mayo, others escaped the horrors of the famine by travelling to England, and among them were the families of James MacDonald and Belinda McCaffrey. This modern vessel is far removed from that used by the MacDonald and McCaffrey families, but I am now making that same trip as an essential part of my own journey of discovery. We have no direct evidence of what part of Ireland James MacDonald came from. In later census returns he simply stated his place of birth in the mid-1830s was Ireland. His father was Andrew, but we have no further details of his family. The city of New York hosts yet another famine memorial which reminds us of Belinda's birthplace. She was the daughter of Peter and Mary Ann and was born about 1842 in Armagh. It is not clear when the two families left Irish shores or exactly where they landed in England, but we know that by the mid-1860s they had joined the large number of Irish emigrants heading to the northwest to earn their living, working in the mines of Cumbria. I am joined on my journey by my brother Bob, and we both have sons working by choice in England. But it was very different for James and Belinda. They were fleeing almost certain death in famine torn Ireland. Yeah, I mean, you can only imagine what it was like, you know. Uh, he is a 12 year old, and uh, the conditions at the time, I mean, he, could, he was probably barefoot. He had known hunger. It was a couple of years after the famine. I mean, his family knew hunger. For him, I suppose, it was an adventure but also a bit terrifying. No, it, it's, particularly, I think, for Linda. It, she would have been younger, yeah. and it, it, when she was younger, and it would have been a terrifying prospect. Getting on the boat was a sailboat, I say. You know, the conditions couldn't have been great. Probably wasn't food on board. Hopefully they had some food with them. corner of England, but first we travel to London to meet up with my son Robert. Um, well, seeing as I was born in 89 and I never got to meet Grandpa Bob, um, 
heard of really any of, you know, Cousins, Kate, Collie, Claire, Una. It'll be nice that I'll be able to, you know, have a connection with that ancestry. And I never, you know, didn't know my great grandparents, obviously, and to be able to connect with that and see it and get a sense of the history, uh, you know, I think it'd be great. Really looking forward to it. Our journey takes us through the picturesque Lake District which attracts tens of thousands of visitors and hikers every year. It is beautiful countryside, but just a brief stop before we reach our destination. This is the port of Whitehaven. Whitehaven is on the northwest coast of England. It is the closest point geographically to Belfast um, in our country. And if you look just over there, just beyond where the two white um, lighthouse um, type things are, the two landmarks for this harbour, um, you can see in the mists beyond on a clear day you can barely make out the Irish coastline and we believe, although it is not certain, but we believe that this is where James and Linda would actually have travelled to in their desperate efforts to get away from the, the appalling life that was um, being wrought upon them and their families by the famine. Now the reason that this is such a relevant uh, point in the MacDonald history is that just about four miles that way as I'm pointing, is where they eventually came to, uh, to set up um, their homes and to live for the next 25 to 30 years. Whitehaven is steeped in history, as thousands of Irish travelled here from the many ports on the east coast of Ireland. There is still a sizeable Irish population in the area, many of whom are descendants of those who initially travelled here. In 1866, James MacDonald, who was working as an iron ore miner, married Belinda McCaffrey at the Mission Church here in Cleeter Moor. They would have a family of four boys. Patrick was born in 1869. John, my grandfather, arrived in 1870. Robert was born in 1874. And James in 1876. But life was hard and miners had to be tough men. Local historian David Banks spoke to us about the kind of lives they led. It, it is a misconception that their women folk came to work in the mills uh, because the men folk were already here and in fact it was actually the other way around. Somehow uh, Innsworth recruited young Irish girls to come and work in his mills. Uh, they mostly lived in, in lodgings in Clayter and they sent went word back to their menfolk, a lot of whom were in places like Wicklow where there was a lot of mining going on at that time. And they came over here to work in the iron ore mines, which, where Stirling's uh, miners came from. I mean, he probably had 80% of his miners were Irish Catholics. And, and were there many mines in this area in the 50s and 60s? In an area from Claytonmoor down to Egremont, there would be a hundred shafts. One hundred mines. One hundred shafts. Yeah. Not mines, shafts. But, but shafts. Uh, my, mines, if you like, in this area are a collection of shafts. So Montreal would have so many, Ainsworth would have so many, the Clayton Company would have so many, Crossfield Company would have so many. Uh, a lot of that's detailed on the paper I've just given you. And, and the Montreal mine, you reckon that if our people were Catholics and they were, that chances are they would have worked for the Montreal mine. If, if you were a betting man, the, 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 the chances would be best that they would be working for Montreal mines. And what kind of lives would they have had? Uh, what kind of homes would they have lived in? Uh, did they work seven days a week, six days a week? Mostly the miners worked six days a week. Um, they didn't work as long hours as the, as the colliers in Whitehaven did. They, they would work maybe eight hours. But you have to remember that iron ore is considerably heavier than coal. It's a very, very arduous job. Um, at that time, the men would come back from the iron ore mines completely red from head to toe. And like most miners, they would be washed down in uh, a tin bathtub in front of the fire. Um, but most of the time, they would be red. And, and uh, everything was red. Th 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 their lives otherwise? Um, again, like most miners, they spent most of their time outside. Uh, you know, they would maybe have allotment gardens, they would maybe have pigeons or dogs or something of that nature. 
Uh, some of them got involved in Cumberland and Westmoreland wrestling, they became pretty good at that. Um, but mostly outdoor pursuits because they were in very damp conditions, very dirty conditions most of their working day. I, and and lots of people locally tell us that in in some parts of this it's referred to as Little Ireland because there were so many Irish families. Cl Claytonmore was Little Ireland, yeah. Um, I mean, you're talking about possibly 70 to 80 percent uh, Irish and mostly Catholics at that time. Not all the Irish were Catholics. Um, we have maybe. 10-15% uh, of, of the Irish that came here were, were Protestants for, from County Down, places like that. Um, but they worked mostly in the, uh, the crossfield mines or they worked in the ironworks. Now, my grand great grandparents, they lived in Frithington. Was there mining around Frithington, or would they have lived in Frithington and worked the mines in Cleeter or? No, no, no. They, they, they'll have worked mines in in Frithington. There were iron ore mines all the way through uh, Frithington, and also coal mines on the western side of Frithington, the same as Claytonmore. There were coal mines on the western side of Claytonmore. Uh, in fact. Montreal number no. four, which was one of Sterling's mines, is the only mine in the northern hemisphere that mined both coal and iron ore from the same shaft. The only other one in the world was in South Africa. This is a wet, a very damp morning in the Catholic graveyard at Cleeter Moor. Um, the headstones here reveal um, a distinct tale of the history of this place and the, some of the uh, grave markings that we have here date back well into the 19th century. Some of them we've just been looking at are the 1850s and the 1860s. Unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, we cannot see any MacDonald or McCaffrey headstones or grave markings here in this graveyard. But one thing is certain, that this graveyard took the deceased of Cleeter Moor and the surrounding area and uh, uh, the inhabitants, the miners, the miners' wives, their children who unfortunately died, they were all buried in this graveyard. So undoubtedly our forebears are buried somewhere here in this graveyard. The village of Frizzington, just a couple of miles away, was where the McDonald's and McCaffrey's put down roots. James and Belinda lived at 20 Griffin Row, one of a number of miners' cottages in the centre of the village. This makeshift car park in the centre of Frizzington is to all intents and purposes a nondescript location. But the reality is that this is perhaps the most significant location of all for the MacDonald and McCaffrey families. Because right behind me is where the miners' cottages stood in Frizzington. And this particular location is where the MacDonald and McCaffrey cottages stood in the 1860s and the 1870s. Meanwhile, Belinda's brother James had met and fallen in love with the local servant girl, Bridget Hagen. James and Bridget married in 1872, and they would have a total of 13 children, 11 of whom survived. Little Linda McCaffrey was born in 1878, and just two doors away, her first cousin Jack was now seven years of age. But the mines of Cleeter Moor and Frizzington were by now becoming less profitable. Just weeks after her birth in 1878, Linda McCaffrey's family came back to Ireland and found a home in Bellevue Buildings in Rialto. Four years later, in 1882, they were joined by Belinda and her four sons. But James had other ideas, and exactly what those ideas were almost remained out of our reach for all time. But for now, our story took us here, to Rialto, in the heart of Dublin City. As the year 1882 dawned, Belinda left Cumbria with her four boys, Patrick, John, Robert and James. And she came to Dublin to live here in Rialto, and right behind me is Rialto Buildings. She found her first Dublin home here in number 71, but she had to rely on the generosity and the hard work of her brother Robert McCaffrey. Robert had come home ahead of Belinda and with the rest of the McCaffrey family and he had managed to find a job here in Guinness at St James's Gate. He worked as a fitter's helper and it was his meagre earnings as a fitter's helper that helped sustain both himself and Linda and indeed the four boys. Right behind me 
is the first MacDonald home in Dublin. Having seen how her brother had found work at Guinness, Belinda quickly aimed for similar employment for her sons as soon as they were of employable age. Just before his 16th birthday, Paddy got a job as a machinery boy in the engineering department. He would eventually rise to become a commercial clerk with the brewery. In 1886, Jack followed suit and by the end of the century had one promotion to become the brewery storekeeper. Young Bob joined the company in 1889, again as a machinery boy. But his career was also quickly on an upward curve and he would eventually hold the position of head timekeeper, no doubt keeping an eye on the timekeeping of his brothers and extended family members. And while Jem bucked the trend by becoming an upholsterer, details of the working lives of his brothers were diligently kept by Guinness and are retained here at the Guinness storehouse. The records are invaluable social documents and priceless to family members of those who worked in the world-famous brewery. Archivist Deirdre Flood showed us some of the material relating to members of the extended MacDonald family. Here we have the original personnel files of your family. So first of all we have, this is the original personnel record of your grandfather John. So you can see from the cover even that we still keep all the records within their original covers. And, and, and that, that will go back to the 1880s, 1890s? Yeah, yeah, our records begin in the 1880s because the company first introduced pensions to all their employees. So for the first time they have to restart, start recording information about the employees such as their dates of birth, when they first started working here, how long they worked here for, what departments they would have worked in, um, just tracing their, their whole career after So all that detail is contained in yeah, there? Yeah, so all the documentation is Great. in here. So even from the outside cover though you can see there's a summary of John's career here that okay. says that he began working at the age of 15 on the 3rd of August in 1886 in the engineering department. It gives his date of birth as the 25th of September in 1870. And like many of our employees, he stayed working at the brewery until he was pensioned. And that was the 2nd of January in 1933. Um, and he and died? He died on the 13th of October in 1943. Great. And, and what, what have we got here then? And then um, here we are. have a record of your maternal grandfather, James McCaffrey. Um, here this is a, a pension record that we hold of, of James in, in one of our pension ledgers. So again, this he, is just... He'd be my, my, my maternal great-grandfather. Great-grandfather, yeah. yeah. Um, so this gives again just a summary of when he was working at the brewery and his address at the time was Bellevue Buildings, number 50. You can see here as well that he had his own unique register number or what was a personnel number. And he also worked in the engineer's department as a tradesman. Um, his occupation in, in particular stated that he was a foreman, a, a plate layer. And the engineer's department would have been one of the largest departments within the brewery. So they are all res responsible for all the engineering the, all the, the, the brewery buildings, maintenance, etc. And a plate layer would have had something to do with the narrow gauge railway, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we had our own uh, railway systems here, which was designed by our chief engineer, Mr. Gagan. Um, we had eight miles of railway track um, in the brewery here, and it's, it's still in existence today. You can just look out the windows and you, and you see it today as well. So he would have uh, worked in that particular area. And it also gives um, his employment when he first began on the 1st of May in 1878. Um, unfortunately, James didn't seem to know what his own date of birth was. Which was common at the time. Yeah, yeah, mm. very much so. Um, but he, he must have had some idea though because he knew his age. <laughs> All right. So. And, and I'm fascinated by the wages and conditions. Yeah, yeah. Um, he would have earned 64 shillings stating there per week. And on retirement, he received um, 12 shillings of a bonus. Um, so the wages here at the brewery, they would have been well paid for, for the time. Yes, they would have come. Um, and salaries would have been slightly higher than the average industrial wage as well. Young Linda McCaffrey, meanwhile, was working as a waitress and making a valuable contribution to her family's income. 
They lived at Bellevue Buildings, and even though they were cousins, there was clearly a spark between her and Jack MacDonald. As the century drew to a close, they were seeing more and more of each other. But they were both from staunch Catholic families, and marriage between first cousins was frowned upon by church authorities. But undaunted, they set about making formal application to marry. The papers landed on the desk of the Archbishop of Dublin, Dr William Joseph Walsh, and after due consideration, the Archbishop's office confirmed that a special marriage dispensation in the second degree of consanguinity had been sanctioned. Jack and Linda were married here at St Catherine's Church in Dublin's Mead Street, literally around the corner from where they both lived on May 28, 1902. He was 31 and she was 24. However, when it came to recording the marriage in the register, Jack was declared to be James MacDonald. My cousin Jack Ennis met with brother Bernard Toomey of St Catharines to inspect the marriage record. Look over here, this book is the history of the marriages in St Catharines Church in Street from 1892. And here in this book we have the names of James, who is known as John MacDonald, and Blendy Caffrey, who were married in this church on the 28th of May in uh, 1902. So this is the name here. Uh, James, it says here, but actually that should be John MacDonald. And and Blendy uh, Caffrey, and John's family lived in Firewire on the street. And uh, Blendy's family lived in 50 Bellevue. Uh, John's father's name was James. Yeah. And this is his mother's name. Belinda. Belinda McCaffrey. McCaffrey. And Belinda's father's name was James also. And my mother's name was Richard uh, Hagen. Hagen. And both of the families lived in one and Royalto and the Bellevue buildings. Uh, this here would be a, a, a special dispensation they got. Uh, from the archdiocese, because they were from the vicar general. Uh, yeah, from the vicar general of the archdiocese, um, and that just says the it's called the second degree, degree of consanguinity, and this line here is May, yeah, and then they they got married. They were married by uh, Father P. I think it's Crimmins. Crimmins. The, the best man was James McCaffrey, and James lived in 58 Bellevue Building. And the uh, bridesmaid was Mary McCaffrey, who also lived in 50 Bellevue Buildings. And just at the end here, then there's just it says dispensation from the Archdiocese, from the Archbishop of Dublin. That's it, John. It's a fabulous record in good name. Well. By the end of the century, Belinda and her sons had moved from Rialto Buildings around the corner to number 5 Rialto Street and shortly after they were married in 1902 Jack and Linda moved into number 21 Rialto Street a home that they would eventually share with Jack's mother as she became elderly in the early years of the 20th century. Belinda became seriously ill with a kidney disease in the middle of 1910 and finally passed away at St Vincent's Hospital on the 25th of September that year. Shortly afterwards, Jack and Linda moved to a new home, 140 Southview Terrace on South Circular Road. This was where my father and his brothers and sisters were to grow up. There were 10 MacDonald children in all, but baby John, born in 1908, lived just a short time. Little Belinda was just five when she died from pneumonia brought on by heart failure in May 1910 and Jackie was only 12 when he died in 1924 from a wasting disease similar to TB. Belinda and Jackie were both buried in their granny's grave at Glasnevin Cemetery. Jack and Linda clearly loved children and there was great sorrow when Jack passed away in 1943 and Linda just three years later. She was mourned most of all by their seven children. My father Bob, his brothers Jim, Don and Ned. 
and by his sisters, Mary, Bridget, and Rosaline, all of whom are no longer with us. Both my MacDonald grandparents died before I was born, so I met up with Jack Ennis again at Glasnevin Cemetery to visit their grave. Exactly who is buried here? Well, there's Jack, our grandfather, and Linda, our grandmother, and uh, the two of their children, young Jackie and uh, Belinda. Belinda, who was the child of died. And together with them, there is our great grandmother, Belinda, who was born in 1840, and she was 70 years old when she died and was buried here in 1910. So this is, this is a, a particularly special place for our family, isn't it? It's a, a mo the most significant place for us here because uh, these were the, the, the first people to go to God that we would have remembered and uh, the grave is now in a little bit of disrepair because they've been doing some work here in the cemetery but uh, we come here often enough. And this is, a, this is a particularly special cross, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The, the family law would have it that that cross was cast in Guinness's Brewery. Most, ap they, most they, appropriate. They were involved in the, the, the steel and the lead industry when they were working in Frisington as miners and they, they brought that skill and that trade back with them and that cross was made especially for our great grandmother. But what happened to James MacDonald, my great grandfather? Thankfully, my cousin Linda O'Connor had the answer. Well, we were on our way to Conlorando Springs and the flight brought us to Denver and uh, we had to wait for a couple of hours in Denver and then we went on to Colorado Springs and we had a great time and everything else. But when I came back, Uncle Ned always used to ring and say, well, where were you this time, lover? What, what, what did you see? And I'd fill him in, of course. So I told him, well, I was in Denver and I was in Colorado Springs and he said, Denver, but did you know your great grandfather was buried in Denver? And I didn't know that. And uh, so he told me a little bit about it and he said, now if I'd known you could have gone to, gone to see the grave, but he didn't know and I didn't know. And as it turned out, I wouldn't have been able to find it anyway, if I, even if I had time. So that's how I found out about it. So that was, I suppose, very deep in me subconscious for a long number of years and it wasn't until years later Brian was looking for information actually I think you were looking for my mother's date of, of, of uh, her death and uh, you mentioned that the only person you hadn't been able to find out about was the great-grandfather and um, the I said well you'd be searching a long time in Dublin because he's in Denver and tell, tell me, Linda, about, um, uh, about you as a child in 140, and do you remember particularly a trunk? Yes, up on the landing in 140, there was a big, big wooden trunk, which was very handy for doing practicing your Irish dancing on, or any sort of singing or dancing that we felt like doing. And, uh, of course, we didn't have a television in those days, so we did a lot of entertaining ourselves. So Claire and Pat and myself spent a lot of time up there and we were told that that actually that big trunk originally was where my the great grandmother had um, packed all her fa her family stuff when they're on their way back from from Frisington uh, and that she was the idea was that she came over to say goodbye to everybody and then she was going to go off to America uh, once the husband had got somewhere to, to live and work he was going to send for her and they were going to go off, but that never happened because he died. Now began the task of trying to find a needle in a haystack. So exactly how could an Irishman, mining for less than a year in Colorado in the 1880s, be traced almost 130 years later? Well, perhaps through the internet. In hope rather than confidence, my internet query found its way to the screen of retired health services manager Paul Darahy in the town of Parker, Colorado, and he would eventually provide the last piece in the jigsaw. His information pointed firmly to the small mining town of Leadville, high up in the Rocky Mountains. My wife Helen and I travelled to the Darahy home in Parker to hear more. But first, 
we had a surprise visitor as we chatted over lunch. For the last five or six years, I've been a member of what's called Random Acts of Genealogical Kindness. It's a website run by volunteers where people who have research requests in a, in a distant area will post a, a query and I get an email and it says basically can you help me find an obituary, a probate record, um, a city directory entry, addresses, photos of the house, photos of the graveyard, anything having to do with trying to fill in the family tree information. Uh, some of the requests are pretty straightforward and, and frankly boring. Some of them are intriguing. Um, so you got a request from me and an email from me in 2009? I received a request that was unusual. The, at first I laughed and scratched my head and said this is the nuttiest thing I've ever heard of. Looking for an Irishman in Colorado in 1885 and we didn't know where or when. But the more I thought about it, uh, the more intriguing the idea became to give it a shot. The second thing was, and the more important I think of the two, is that we, Terry and I, Terry's another researcher that works with me, he and I have a bias towards people from other countries. We as Americans are always asking someone in another country to help us with the Irish research, the Scottish, the Ukrainian, whatever. And when we get a request from someone from another country, we go, uh, we go a little bit harder to, to satisfy the request. It's a payback in, in some ways. The, f the first request, as I recall, was somewhat general. Um, you knew that he had gone to Colorado, but not where. Uh, the first aspect had to be to figure out how in the hell to research it, how to focus it, how to, how to dig through the, the, to find it. We did, I did the basic stuff using the census, city directories, things like that to try to locate as many McDonald's as we could and then start narrowing it down. A corollary to that was to start learning the history of the Irish and especially in the mining communities and that turned out to be fortuitous because most of the Irish, like other minorities, would migrate towards certain areas. They would stick together. Um, at some point, we had gotten basic information. We had some leads. The guy's age was right. The uh, location was good. Uh, we knew where he was buried up in Leadville. There was only six or eight others to rule out at some point. Um, by uh, coincidence, I had my two niece and nephew visit me one summer and they had wanted to go to Leadville for other reasons, so we said, let's go. So we drove up to Leadville, which is about an hour and a half, two hours from here. It's a beautiful part of the state, and it's great to go up any time. It doesn't make any difference what the reason is. And after we did the family business, we went out to the local cemetery, the, the uh, Evergreen Cemetery, which had a Catholic section. And we walked the cemetery, took some pictures, was, was not able to find any gravestones, which we didn't expect because the records didn't show any. But then when I came back home, uh, we pulled all that together and forwarded it to you as our first report, or second report, I don't remember. And then uh, subsequent to that, the, uh, it, it's, like a, it's like a, it's a question that's not answered and it keeps nagging and you keep going back and trying to figure out what you missed. And between your efforts and the Cleeter Moore research and some of the other things I was able to find in books and newly published books about Irish history in Denver, I think you've got a, a pretty solid case for the, the James McDonald that's in Evergreen Cemetery is, in fact, your lost relative. We headed back to Denver, taking in some of the unique Colorado atmosphere, before preparing for what we hoped was the last stage in our journey to find James McDonald. The Rockies are quite simply stunning, but it was not for the scenery that James came here 130 years ago. He was intent on making his fortune in the rich silver mines of Leadville, almost 11,000 feet above sea level. Today there is a population of just a couple of thousand in Leadville. When James MacDonald came here in 1882, such was the mining boom that the population spiralled to 40,000 in just a couple of years. Many other Irish came to Leadville. Oscar Wilde arrived in 1882 and gave a lecture on house decoration. 
the founder of the Irish Land League, Michael Davitt, visited in 1880 and in 1886. And heavyweight boxing champion John L. Sullivan defended his title here in 1883. Many other miners from Cleeter Moor also made the journey to Leadville, also all in the hope of making their fortune and sending for their loved ones back home. For a mere $3 for a 10-hour day, they slaved away underground and in extreme weather conditions while the mine owners made vast profits from the silver ingots, like the ones pictured here, and which were produced by the miners. And on the odd occasion when the workers rebelled against their conditions, the owners were quick to call in the National Guard to keep everything under control. Today, there are still images of those mining days, but Leadville is a very different place from what it was in the late 19th century. The town still lives off the memory of those days with a mining museum and a saloon that promises to be the oldest in the territory. Otherwise, it is a popular destination for hikers, mountaineers and sightseers. In winter, it has no visitors. There is no public transport to Leadville. And if you don't visit in summer, because of the altitude, you will probably have to wait another year. The Leadville City Directory of 1882 shows James MacDonald Minor living at 501 East 3rd Street. The address is still in existence today, and while the dwelling in which James MacDonald lived is long gone, this is where he set up home for the brief time that he was in Leadville. James eventually went to work in a mining outpost 18 miles from Leadville, in the new town of Kokomo. It was nothing more than a collection of minor shacks and poorly constructed mines. The conditions were appalling and death and disease were everywhere. In winter, the temperature in the Rockies falls to minus 20. His first harsh winter proved too much for James and he became seriously ill, finally passing away here in Kokomo in December 1882. To their enormous credit, his fellow miners somehow managed to bring his body back to Leadville, where his remains were taken to the newly opened Church of the Annunciation. The church had largely been built by the Irish, and it is here that his funeral mass was held on December 26th, 1882. Cathy Micklich is the manager of the parish office of the Church of the Annunciation in Leadville, and she is also keeper of crucial records detailing the funeral of James MacDonald. Okay, so you got an email uh, or a letter from uh, Paul Darahy in 2009, mm -hmm. which was essentially my query. Um, and you managed to find uh, records for my great-grandfather, James MacDonald. Correct, yes. Okay, yeah. and uh, what do we have here? This book that's just in front of you, Kathy? Okay. This is the actual sacramental record um, for the interments, which means any person that passed away was recorded here. What we have is their date of death, which is James McDonald's, was recorded as December 26th. Um, place of birth, they list as Ireland. Um, the age at the time of his death was 48, according to our records. Um, he died from pneumonia. The priest that performed the Mass was Henry Robinson. And the cemetery was the Evergreen Cemetery, where he was interred. But this is the actual sacramental records. And this dates back to, I believe, 18, 1882 to 1909 is what this book is. So that's, a, that's an absolutely invaluable document, Kathy. Priceless. Remarkably, his death also made the local newspaper. A paragraph on the back page of the Leadville Daily Herald, dated December 28, 1882, said, The remains of James MacDonald, who died at Kokomo a short time ago, were buried from the Church of the Annunciation yesterday morning. Mr. MacDonald had many friends in Leadville, having lived here a long time, and they were well represented at the funeral. The interment was in Evergreen Cemetery. A little bit of journalistic license was clearly taken by the author of that report. 
We had arranged for Mass to be said for James at the Church of the Annunciation. The arrangements were included in the weekly newsletter. Much of the interior of the Church of the Annunciation is exactly as it was when his funeral Mass was held here in 1882. Parish priest Father Jesse Perez is the celebrant. final appointment in Leadville was with the local undertaker. Each summer we have a lot of visitors to the area uh, based upon the history of Leadville and had a lot of folks from out of country and out of state that passed through here and I'm very delighted to help the McDonald family, Mr. and Mrs. McDonald, with Mr. McDonald's great-grandfather's monument. From my own research and with Shannon Kent's assistance, we finally pinpointed the grave of James MacDonald at Evergreen Cemetery on the edge of Leadville. The public records state that he is buried at Block 4C, Lot 28, in the Catholic section, and NM states that there is no marker on his grave. 130 years after he died here in Leadville, and MacDonald has finally got to come and visit the grave of James MacDonald, my grand great-grandfather, our great-grandfather, the great-grandfather of my generation. And he died on the 26th of December, 1882. His funeral mass was held in the Church of Annunciation here in Leadville. And his funeral then, his funeral procession, took place, as it was, to a grave a couple of hundred yards behind me. And we are now going to go there to pay our respects and I suppose to pay the respects of the entire MacDonald family to everybody, uh, on behalf of everybody um, to a man who um, came to this part of the world in the hope of making a better life for his wife and for his family. And I'm here on behalf of my brothers and sisters, on behalf of my dad, Bob, on behalf of my grandfather, John or Jack. Uh, and I suppose more particularly uh, on behalf of my great-grandmother, Belinda. This little strip of ground behind me measures about six yards square and this is the final resting place of James MacDonald. It is six yards square with these two very old evergreen trees uh, standing just towards the front of it and from what we can see is there are at least five people are buried here. Now our research has shown that there is a facility here for anything up to 10 people to be buried and that is the way people were buried in the late 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century as such. So somewhere in this particular plot and we believe it is probably between the latter two crosses that are just behind me and that is the spot that we, we believe is where James MacDonald is buried. It is a very quiet and peaceful place and uh, if somebody was to have eternal rest, well then he couldn't have picked a better, better place.
and so our journey has been completed. But it is not the end of the story because this young lady is Rachel Mary MacDonald. She is daughter of Olivia and my son John, which means she is granddaughter of Helen and I. And that makes her great granddaughter of my parents, Bob and Mary. She is great, great granddaughter of Linda and Jack. And great, great, great granddaughter of Belinda and James MacDonald, who no longer lies in an unmarked grave at the top of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado.